From my experience in this league, we have the best medical people and the best training staff I've been around. That's not to discount anybody else, but these guys are as good as anybody I've ever been with. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball. Today we're going to be looking back at Sunday's nine games in the NBA, previewing week 16 for the league and looking at Monday for DFS where there are five games on Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. Let us get to it indeed. We will start where we always do on these shows. Monstrous line of the night. And it goes to James Harden. Once again, now, Chris Paul, Chris Paul, Chris Paul was back, but I was going to say Paul George was pretty close to getting the monstrous line of the night, but it does go to Harden once again. 40 points, 11 rebounds, 6 assists. He had 4 triples, a steal, and another 3 blocks. 14 of 27 from the field and 8 of 9 from the line. I think it's time for us to also bury the narrative that Harden sucks at defense. He is doesn't suck at defense. He is solid enough in certain spots. He can be beaten in, in some areas. Some areas, at times, he doesn't try as much. But I don't think that's really been too much of an issue in terms of his lack of defensive effort for about the last two or three years, really. And as a post defender, he's very, very good. He's generating steals and blocks at extremely high rates. And of course, the offensive stuff uh, remains absolutely ludicrous. Over the last month, he's averaging 44, 9, and 8. Yeah. Uh, with two steals and 1.2 blocks. And that, that goes under the radar. Like 44, 9, and 8 is ridiculous. But two steals and 1.2 blocks and 5.73s, that is just a, an absolutely ludicrous combination of stats and getting to the line 15 times and hitting 90% of them. We're talking about a guy who, in that last month, has three fantasy categories over with a Z score of over four and another two with a Z score over 2.2. Like They are nonsense numbers. The only category where he's a negative is field goal percentage, and it's a pretty decent negative, a negative 1.92, as he's shooting 44% on 29 attempts. But those other numbers are just so, so big um, for, uh, for, um, for Harden so far this season, and it's been absolutely unbelievable to have him on your team. I'm sure you're really, really enjoying it, and the encouraging thing was he did it with Chris Paul back in the team. Waiver wire line of the night. The waiver wire line of the night it was quite comp- quite a big competition for it today, but it does end up going to Patrick Beverly. He's available in seventy seven percent of Yahoo leagues. Is Beverly put up another strong game? Thirty six minutes, sixteen ten and eight with four triples, a steal, and a block on five of ten shooting. And without Danilo Gallinari around, he's getting a lot of minutes. He's moved into the starting lineup, and over the last five games, the fewest minutes he's played has been 34 during that time. Now, he's managed to crack the top 100 over the last two weeks, 8-8 eight and eight with four assists, a steal, and a block. The field goal percentage isn't good. The free throw percentage isn't good. But at the time, for the time being, he is an interesting short-term stream. 14-team leagues, definitely. 12-team leagues, yeah, he's on that borderline. He's not going to be a must-roster guy, I don't think, because when Gallinari comes back, probably in the next two games, it is going to have somewhat of an impact on Beverly. And even now, he's not blowing us out of the water, despite this game being really, really strong. And he had a massive game against the Spurs as well, the first game that he moved back into the starting lineup. But yeah, there's been some stinkers in the middle there or some yeah, average-type games. He's okay, in a short as a short term ad for twelve team leagues, but far from a must roster priority guy. The deep leaguer of the night goes to Wayne Selden of the Chicago Bulls with Chandler Hutchison out. Selden stepped into the starting lineup and played thirty eight minutes. He had fifteen points with three triples, six rebounds, three assists, a steal, and a block on six of eight shooting. Seldo was really really strong here in this game. We've seen flashes from him before back in his time in Memphis, but. If Hutchison's out for the next two to four weeks and Selden's going to start and play 30-plus minutes, now he's not going to be able to shoot 75%. We're well aware of that. But it's the fact that he rebounded. He got some assists. And he showed some ball handling chops in Memphis at times. Uh, He got a steal and a block here as well, which was relatively solid. He can be maybe a stream 12-team league guy. He's he's available in 100% of Yahoo leagues, allegedly. So you can go and add him in all 20s, 18s, and probably 16-teamers. And even in 14-team leagues, and again, maybe even in 12-team leagues, a bloke who's going to play 35 minutes a night as a starter, who does have the ability to get some steals and has the ability 
uh, to get some uh, to get some assists and score and hit some threes, which Selden has the ability to do all those things. He's a really, really interesting piece to keep an eye on. Not, again, we're not selling out to get him, and there are plenty of other 12-team ads that you can look at, and I talked about a lot of those on the waiver wire show I did earlier today. Zubats, for example, is a, a great one of those. Ken Fareed, if he's still around here, there's a lot of these options. But Selden, I think I mentioned Selden on that show as well, really, really stepping it up here, and uh, couldn't have asked for a better uh, first game as a starter for those Chicago Bulls. Let's go on to the next one. Young Gun of the Night. Yeah, you already know who it's going to be. The Young Gun, well, if you're watching on video, you can see it up on the screen. The Young Gun of the Night is Luka Doncic of the Dallas Mavericks. He just had another triple-double as a 19-year-old. That's his second in the last uh, in the last week. 35, 12, and 10. 58% shooting. He was uh, 14 of 24 from the field. The free throws continue to annoy us. Four of six, but that is... It's just ridiculous, these sort of numbers that, that Doncic is putting up. He's averaging 27 and 5.5 and with 2.5 and threes and 1.2 steals. And the reason, look, he's only the 46th ranked player over the season. The reason he's not there is the percentages. He's, he's not higher, sorry, not you know, top 20. is because he's shooting 73 from the line, which continues to frustrate me because he was an 80% guy in Europe. And yes, 43 from the field and 73 from the line. Get those to 46 and 80, and then you are talking about a top 20, top 25 sort of guy, and I believe he's going to be a top 15 guy for many, many years to come. It's going to look... It, it, maybe this is hyperbolic, and it probably is. And Sorry, it almost definitely is, but you get the feeling that going back and looking at this draft, it's going to get to that Michael Jordan stage draft. Yeah, Clyde Drexler was good, but he wasn't Jordan. Like, I'm sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. Clyde, in a similar, I know Clyde Drexler was in that draft. The Blazers passed on, on Jordan because they had Clyde Drexler. And you can say that with the Kings. De'Aaron Fox is good, but he's no Luka Doncic. And you go go back to all, all those, so yeah, Hakeem was, was, was great, that's fine. But he's no Jordan, he's still excellent. And that, maybe, that's, maybe that's DeAndre Ayton, but he's no Jordan. And while I've screwed this metaphor up just by confusing you all, I get the feeling we'll look back at this and say, yeah, Aiden had a good career. He was really, really good. Yeah, Bagley was strong. Yeah, Trey Young was, was solid. But they're no Doncic. And I think that's how we're going to end up looking back at this draft really, really early to tell that. And this is, to say that this guy is unbelievable is not to say that these other guys are terrible. But you get the feeling that we're looking at a... I don't know if generational is the, the right word, probably not, but a, uh, a really, really, really high-level guy, and it could uh, it could come back to bite some of these franchises in the ass, even if they do end up with strong players. And that's a, that's a possibility with all those other guys that were taken ahead of him. But Doncic continues to be really, really amazing in you know, 50 games into his NBA career. I tell a man's not hot. The dud of the night is JaVale McGee. Of the Los Angeles Lakers, 11 minutes, 5 points, 3 rebounds. He got killed because if it's Zubats was killing it again. I think that if you have McGee and Zubats is available, and he's available in 65% of leagues, I would make that switch. I think Zubats is a guy to grab in all 12 team leagues. You might remember a couple of years ago, before his rookie season, I was big on Zubats. I was big on him in his rookie season. And even last year, I said, keep an eye on Zubats. It's a bad situation for him with Lopez there. But next season, there's a real opportunity for him heading into his third year. Now, I didn't expect this. And I didn't think the Lakers were going to play him, especially after they you know, brought McGee in and started him. And then they brought Tyson Chandler. And I thought, well, is this done for Zubats? So are we out on him completely? But he is turning into the guy that a lot of his advanced projection numbers look like coming in as a rookie, coming over from Europe. Yeah, big, big numbers for him, and that's really impacting JaVale. And while JaVale was good to start the season, I think that if you need to make that move to switch for Zubats or even to drop McGee for somebody else in 10 and 12 team leagues, I think you should be really looking at that very, very closely. Now, last game, McGee played more minutes than Zubats, so it is up in the air, and Walton's rotations can be frustrating. But what we're seeing from Zubats is really fantastic, and all the momentum is his going in his direction, and I think he's going to remain the starter for this team and being a 20-plus minute a night guy for the foreseeable future, which makes him a very valuable fantasy guy. The goats of the day, plus minus goats. The highest net rating went to Jim Ennis 
of the Houston Rockets, plus 128.4, while the worst net rating went to Josh Okogie, a negative 98.9. Okogie struggled. He got smacked in the head, but he was okay after that. Ennis was really, really uh, solid for this Rockets team and played more minutes than Austin Rivers with Chris Paul back. That's worth mentioning uh, when we look at Rivers and what his long-term value is on this team, but nothing really actionable in terms of adding these guys based on these performances. Let's talk some injuries. I talked about Hutchison already. He's out for the next two to four weeks with this fractured toe. Um, yeah, again, Bulls medical staff, there's always something weird going on there with this team. And um, yeah, Boylan coming out with just dumb quote after dumb quote after dumb quote. I was really proud of Hutchison playing on that broken toe. Were you? Like, why? He just says the dumbest... He just he just needs to coach in high school. It's simple as that. Like this sort of rah rah, I'm a tough guy. Look how big my nuts are. Sort of attitude is. Like, does it really work in any sort of professional environment? It sounds absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, Hutchison was yeah, he was coming off a 40 minute game. He had a double double. He was starting to look like he maybe he could be a 12 team league guy. But of course, fracturing your toe, missing the basically the the whole of uh, the next two three weeks is going to have an impact on that. He'll probably come back and start after that. But you can't hold on to him through this time. The Blue Arrow has a uh, an ankle sprain that's going to keep him out Monday. And we had the old doctor putting on the stethoscope, Michael Malone, uh, after the game when Murray sprained his ankle and, and didn't return to the game. Oh, yeah, we could have put him out there. He could have finished the game if we had needed him to. The next day, Malone's gone, oh, you know what? It's actually pretty swollen. It looks, uh, looks pretty bad. And now he's been ruled out in advance, you know, 24 hours in advance of Monday's game. So once again, the doctor yeah, providing us with uh, Chicago Bulls medical staff level of medical knowledge there by saying he could have come back into the game, yet not able to play 48 hours later. So I think there's a real chance. And Murray's been dealing with significant leg and lower leg uh, issues for most of this season. So that's a real problem. And I wouldn't be stunned if we get a week on the sidelines here for the Blue Arrow. Farton, Will Barton will likely start at point guard again. And that will uh, you know, give some extra value to Malik, uh, Malik Beasley and Monty Morris on the bench, but not enough for them to be 12-team league guys. Derek Jones Jr. suffered what looked like a pretty bad knee injury today. Wouldn't be stunned if that if that is a, a month versus uh, a month month long or, or months rather than weeks in terms of time for recovery. If he ended up with a you know, an, an ACL injury, I wouldn't be stunned on that one. It, it looked really scary. The X-rays were negative, but that means jack shit in that scenario. We get the MRIs tomorrow to see what happens. Um, there was an opportunity opening up there for him. We saw the Duke Wayne Ellington take a larger role today, and the Heat's rotations can continue to be an absolute mess, and it is 100% guesswork with what Spolster is doing on a nightly basis, and it makes it really tough to uh, rely upon. But I feel safe in saying that we're not going to see Jones for a little bit of time. DeAnthony Melton's going to be out until the All-Star break with that ankle injury. Of course, you can drop him based on that. His minutes were, were plunging anyway. Um, and he's, if he's not going to be back for a couple more weeks here, two, three more weeks here for Melton, it's hard to hold on there. While well, Frankie Nilakina had just got the starting job back uh, with Moutier out with that shoulder injury, then he pinged his groin today. He's unlikely to play in Monday's game against the Hornets. Groins can be a little bit tricky to come back from, so you'd, you'd expect Frank to miss you know, one or two games here. He wasn't really going to be a 12-team league guy, but what this does with Moutier and Nilakina out and the Knicks having four games this week is making Trey Burke an excellent streamer for this week, someone that we can have a look at and and add in a lot of different scenarios, definitely all deeper leagues and even into 14 or maybe even 12 team leagues, you could be looking at Trey Burke just as a short-term stream ad and that's why having a streaming spot on your roster is very, very important for trying to win fantasy leagues. All right, let's move on now. Look at these games in some more detail. We had uh, nine of them on a Sunday, a little bit of a, a busier Sunday than we uh, than we are used to. Of course, the uh, the first game of the day, and I've got a feeling that that isn't the first game of the day. That uh, that graphic that I brought up on the screen, I'm going to have to uh, adjust that. So just uh, just bear with me. All right, that's better. The first game of the day was the Clippers beating the Kings 122 to 108. Bogdan Bogdanovich, only 20 minutes in the last game, but back to 31. He had 19 points with three steals. He looked really good. Heald was solid as well, 16, 4, and 5, although his legendary efficiency dropped right off. Or Darren Fox, 21 points, four rebounds, three assists. Pretty good night from Foxy there. Uh, I, I just I don't understand what Dave Yeager is doing. Uh, we had last game, yeah, Bielitsa had been playing at 12 minutes, 8 minutes, and then he got injured and Bagley started and played a lot of minutes. Here we go. Bagley's going to continue to start. Bielitsa was already being phased out. And then he comes back over the weekend, Bielitsa, and plays like 31 minutes. And you go, what the hell is going on here? And then he starts again here and plays 19 minutes. 
but Bagley still plays under 20 minutes. No fouls, just a complete confusion in how you know, Jaeger's going to run these things. We thought he might dick Bagley around at the start of the season. That's obviously been the case. Now, Bagley was still strong here, 14-5 and five with three blocks in 20 minutes. I'll take that every day of the week. And I do believe he is a 12-team league guy and Bielitsa isn't. But if this sort of back and forward stuff is going to keep going on, it's going to be really frustrating. Iman Schumpert played 31 minutes because I don't know why. 16, no, that's not true because he, he did play pretty well here. 16 points, three triples, six rebounds, and two blocks. Continues to be an underrated source of defensive numbers, especially steals. Not a must-roster guy, but someone who can have that steal stream value. On to the Clippers. We talked Beverly already. Gildas Alexander was great too. 17, 4, and 5 with two steals in 31 minutes. But when Gallinari comes back, does he go back to that weird 20-minute-a-night role that he was playing? Most likely. And Avery Bradley, I've shit on this guy a lot. But he's been pretty good without Gallinari. 12, 6, and 6. Not 12-team good, not 14-team league good, but before he was about an 84-team league player. Now he's pushing back up into at least the 16-team stratosphere. 12, 6, and 6 is relatively solid. Lou Williams had 10 assists to go with 12 points, and Toby Harris had 18 and 6. And the table, Montrez Harrell killed the Kings. 25 and 7 in 29 minutes as he moved back to the bench again. For God knows what reason. Shout out to you, Doc Rivers. Let's go on to the next game. It is the Cleveland Cavaliers. They beat the Bulls 104-101. Clarkson only played 22 minutes, but he still was fantastic. It's against Chicago, so that's all you need. 18-7-6, and six, while Della Vadova had 16-4-5. and five. Big games from those guys. Clarko is more of a fringe 12-team league guy. 36 minutes for Ante Zizic, 8-14 with a steal and a block. If you're going to prioritize the Z-named Eastern Europeans, I'd have Zubats over Zizic. But for now, Ante is worth looking at, especially with all this Larry-on-Larry Larry crime that goes on in Cleveland. Nance, only 17 minutes, missed all four of his shots, had five rebounds. With Tristan Thompson and Kevin Love due to return, that's going to, of course, have some sort of an impact on Zizic. But I wouldn't be shocked if we see Thompson out for the next six weeks. I think that's a real possibility and no problem with that at all. So Zizic is an okay guy to add. Um, and he, again, like Zubats, was a guy coming out of Europe. We go, I like these translations. Let's see if it can happen. And now we're getting that opportunity to see it in practice. Don't look now, but Chetty Osmond's had three good games in a row. The first two were on the back of unsustainably good shooting. We thought, okay, well, that's interesting. Now he shot shit, but still 17 and 8, two threes and two steals. That's good. This is coming back into the sort of territory where I looked at Osman as being a back end 12 team league guy, like your last, second last draft pick in a draft. Um, and he's been disappointing. But this is getting back into discussion, and you can have a look at, at grabbing him because the minutes have gone nowhere this season. It's just the production hasn't been there, but this is three straight games. And when you do that, and then one of them comes not on stupid high shooting, that's encouraging. Alec Burks had 18 and 8. That's strong from him. I don't really see the 12 team appeal. While the, the, the Padawan Colin Sexton, 26 minutes, he is getting worse and worse every game. Short Bobby Portis only, imagined, only managed 7 3 and 3 in his 26 minutes here, and he should not be anywhere near your 12 team leagues or probably 14 team leagues. And I know I like to give guys three years, and I'll still do that with Sexton. My hope of him turning it around is, is relatively limited. As for Nance, I don't know what to do with him at this point. We know that if he gets 25 a night, he's a top 100 guy. But he got 17 a night here without Love and without Thompson. How is he going to get these minutes? I do worry. And say there's a Zubats on your waiver wire, I think I'd consider dropping Nance to grab him. He's, you know, if there's a Jaleel Okafor on my waiver wire, I probably wouldn't do that because I think Okafor's value is much more yeah, limited short term as opposed to you know, someone like Zubats. But it is a frustrating scenario. Also, the four minutes from Channing Fry, would, are they actually necessary? The answer is no, of course. On to the Bulls. Markinen had 21 and 15, just didn't touch the ball down the end of a close game because Boylan got to get that toughness and grit in there. Robin Lopez started 26 minutes, 16 and 7 with four blocks. That's huge from Lopez. Um, his minutes are you know, going to and fro. Boylan made the change because Zizic was starting. Cool. Whatever. Um, yeah, strong enough from Lopez, but still just a deeper league guy. Well, Dunn had six points. I, I, I don't believe this guy is good, and plenty of people take, take me to task on that. Seven assists, two steals, and two blocks. There's a difference between not being a good NBA player and being a, con a contributor for fantasy because he's that. He can contribute, no worries. Seven assists, two steals, and two blocks does it. He just makes bad decisions. He can't shoot. Uh, he, he struggles running an offense, but the stats do get accumulated. So that, that's fine. 
Levine had 17 and 12, not an efficient night, but a strong night, while Punch Bob himself, only the 19 minutes for Portis, 9 and 2. I still think you need to hold him in 12 team leagues, but I get the feeling that anyone who is holding on to the idea that Portis is a good player, if they've watched these last two weeks, I think would have finally come around and been convinced that, you know what, he's not. He's just a, a guy that comes out and, and yeah, puts up the junk time specials. He, he just isn't good. And if you've got him in a dynasty league, if he strings together a couple of 30-minute games and double-doubles in a row, I'd be trying to get any sort of top 80, top 100 value back because on a good team, which of course this isn't, he just isn't going to be a valuable commodity whatsoever. Jabari Parker, only 11 minutes. I think we can rule out that he's going to be taking any of those small forward minutes. They they signed him to play small forward, and now they've played him about five minutes there all season. Just again, the Bulls just killing it at every decision-making turn that they could possibly kill it at. The Bucks and the Thunder, big win for the Thunder, 118-112. Lopez was great for Milwaukee. 19 points with five triples and two blocks continues to be a really, really surprising player this season. While Chris Middleton, who went through a significant slump, this is back to the old Chris Middleton, 22-4-6, and 53% shooting. Not sure I buy it as sticking. While Yanni was really, really quiet to begin this game, but ended up... Um, Ended up putting up some uh, nice numbers. 27 and 18, four assists, one steal. He actually hit three triples, but usually he's a, a field goal percentage savior. He murdered you here. Eight of 22, and of course, he pissed all over your free throw percentage. Eight of 12 there, some massive negatives for uh, for Atatokounmpo. 18 and six for Brogdon, while Bledsoe had a pretty quiet 11, six, and three. And the bench, very little production out of those guys. For the Thunder, Paul George continues to be amazing. 36 and 13. He hit eight triples. He had three steals and shot 57% from the field. A big Paul George night, while Jeremy Grant had 16 points, a surprising four assists. A surprise, to be sure. But it was. And he had five blocks. He is a must roster player who has taken significant steps forward. Westbrook had a triple double, a horrible triple double, to be honest. 13, 13, and 11 on 25% shooting. 20 attempts, that is a massive negative, and one of two from the line. While Adams went to the locker room with an ankle injury, but he did return 14 and 8 with a steal and a block. Now, Terry Ferguson got into some foul trouble. That limited him to 27 minutes, but his steps forward have been massive. 15 points, three triples. He is a viable three point streamer, even in 12 team leagues. He's more of a 16 team ad. I talked about him, I believe, on the Waiver Wise show as well, talking about how he's upped his usage, how he's hitting threes at a significant rate, and he's providing a really good stream value there. And he showed it again. Well, Nerlens Noel provided key minutes with Adams in the locker room, but he is just a defensive stats streamer and a deeper league guy only. The next game we take a look at the Jazz. They beat the Timberwolves. Uh, fairly comfortably in this one, 125-111. Gobert just did what he needs to do, 17-4 and four with three blocks and two steals while ravishing Rick Rubio. 18-4-8 with two steals and shot the ball well. He has fully recovered from that hamstring injury. A lot of people tweet at me or message me or comment on the Instagram or the YouTube videos, you know, do I drop Joe Ingles? My answer to that has consistently been no, but 15 points, 6 assists, 2 steals in 36 minutes is definitely uh, backing up my thought process there. Korva added another 3 triples, one of those 3-point streamers you can find everywhere, while the Don, Donovan Mitchell is Don, is good. Big game from him with 29 points and 5 assists, but the percentages were definitely a little bit lacking in this one. He was just 46% from the field on 22 attempts, but the biggest encouraging thing for me is the fact that he got to the line 10 times. I don't know how many times I banged on about increased free throw rate being the key for him being a top 20 guy. He took 10 free throws. They are so far up over the last two to three weeks that it's impressive. Now, the problem here is he hit only seven of them, so that really dropped his overall value down in this game. For the Wolves... Is Andrew Wiggins playing well? 35 points. True shooting of 67%. Four assists, three steals. He hit three triples. That's really good. Now, he is a much better fantasy player than, say, someone like Harrison Barnes, and he's shown some real issues this season with efficiency, but this is really strong, and he's looked a lot better of late. 22, 6, and 7 with three blocks for Townsie, while Luol Deng, the crypt was opened. He played 26 minutes, 15 points, three triples, and two steals. Took those Anthony Tolliver minutes as the backup three, and I can see him sticking in that role as long as Bob Cove remains out, and I'd say Co Covington's out for another couple of weeks, it looks like, at this point. No Teague, no Rose, no Tyus Jones, so Jared Bayless played 37 minutes, and while those guys are out, Bayless is a 12-team league guy. 19-3-6 with four triples for Jared there, while Taj Gibson got into foul trouble, and that meant that Dario Saric played 30 minutes. Saric also was terrible in those 30 minutes with three points and 11 rebounds. 
And it's pretty clear that he is nowhere near a 12-team league guy. Shout out to Josh Okogie, who went 1 of 10 from the field as well. Just his shooting is a real disaster at this point. The next game, the Raptors, they beat the Mavericks 123-120 on the road. Lowry was great, 19-5-9 with two blocks and five triples. And the fun guy, Kawhi Leonard. I'm a fun guy. <laughs> 33 and 10 with three threes. Dan Green had 10 and Siakam had 14 and 5. Well, Freddie Van Vliet, a nice little performance. 13 points, 6 assists in 21 minutes. As soon as one of the starters goes down, Van Vliet becomes an option, and then he goes back to this 20-minute role. And while this sort of level here is 12-team worthy, it's not going to be sustainable at that sort of uh, elevated level of production. On to the Mavericks. Another 31 minutes from Dennis Smith, 13-4-6, and a triple one. He's a 12-team must-roster player. I've been saying this for weeks. Go and grab him. Uh, DeAndre Jordan had 11 and 9, not his best night, while the pencil had a 14 and 6 on 27% shooting. In a 10-team league, you move on from Harrison Barnes. In a 12-teamer, depends who you're adding. I wouldn't be holding on to him as a prized possession, though. Finney Smith had a nice offensive game. That won't last. 13 points in 28 minutes for him. While Dirk, it looks like Dirk's just going to play 10 minutes a game. 7 points for Dirk in those minutes. Obviously not a fantasy option really in any sort of league. The next game, the Wizards and the Spurs. The Spurs win 132-119 without DeMar DeRozan. My man, Thomas Sataransky, 21-9-8. 62% shooting. 35% of people, 35% of managers in fantasy leagues. You know what I'm going to say? Fingers out of assholes. Pick him up. What is going on? Why is he still on the waiver wire? Is that many leagues inactive? He's good. He's a starting caliber NBA point guard. He's a good starting caliber NBA point guard. 21, 9, and 8. Go and add him, please. Uh, Brad Beal, 21, 4, and 7 with four steals, while Otto Porter remaining on the bench. Just get... What is this Jeff Green bullshit again? 13 points, four assists, and three, three steals for Porter. He's a must-roster guy, of course, while Green... It was okay, actually, to, to be fair to him. 15 points, three, uh, three triples, still just more of a deeper league guy. Well, Tom Bryant, it's, again, hard to predict what's going to happen for him. Yes, there was no Jan Mahinmi and there was no Sam Decker, but the last game, just two games ago, that Mahinmi didn't play, Bryant played, a, played 21 minutes. Here, he played 30 and had 15 and 10. Give him 30 a night, he's a must-roster guy. If he plays 20 a night, it's hard. When Howard and Morris ever eventually return, his value is going to dip. And his value is up and down as it is. So while he's fine to hold in a 12-team league, if you're looking long-term, his value is going to evaporate at some point. For the Spurs, there was no DeRozan, as I mentioned. Aldridge picked it up, 39-6 and six with two blocks, while Pat Mills had a strong game, 15 points, seven assists, and two steals, while the three-point streamers, Bertans, Forbes, and Ballinelli had five, four, and three triples, respectively. Bertans in his first game back after his wife or partner, I'm not sure if they're married, um... Uh, gave birth to a child, 21 points with five triples for Bertans. Him and Bellinelli especially, and Mills, have been absolutely elite in three-point streamers. And it's another reason why guys like Clay Thompson, whose best category in fantasy is three-pointers, is why I value them, even CJ McCollum, I value them so much less than I do other guys because you can find so many of these players that hit two or three triples a game that just float around on the bench. Rudy Gay wasn't at his best 11, 6, and 4, while Derek Whitey White, still available in 42% of leagues. No, again, no idea. Can someone just pick him up? 16, 5, and 4 with a steal for Whitey, who is absolutely 100% locked in as the starting point guard on this team. Next up, we've got the Orlando Magic and the Houston Rockets. The Rockets win 103-98. Vooch just kept it going, 19 and 17. While Aaron Gordon, 23 and 10 for Big Azza. 40 minutes is big and 50% shooting is massive for Gordo. Really strong numbers for him. And it was good to see a bounce back from Fournier, who had 18 points with two steals. Jaron Grant took the backup point guard minutes, did okay here, 4-5-5 five, and five with Isaiah Briscoe out. He also had three steals. will be interesting to see if Grant can have that backup job over Briscoe. Uh, and that would make him obviously just a deep league ad. While uh, John Simmons remains terrible, and DJ Augustin had 10 points in 28 minutes. Now, my man John Isaac, the two steals and the two blocks is really nice. The seven points isn't. The eight rebounds is okay. He remains a luxury stash. He remains a defensive specialist. He is not a must roster guy, in my opinion. He he pushes up and plays 39 for three or four, and you go, yeah, 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 let's go, let's go, let's go. And then it goes back to 24 minutes a night with five points. And it's up and down. But for defensive numbers, he's always got that ability to bring multiples in both of those categories. For the Rockets, Chris Paul, first game back, 25 minutes. Looks like he's going to hover around 30 minutes a game for the rest of the season. 12, 5, and 6 with three steals. But that's as good as you can expect as he comes back. Well, Jimmy Ennis, 
23 minutes. Eric Gordon, 37 minutes, 16 and 5. If you can sell Gordon for a top 70 guy, I would absolutely do it immediately. And then with uh, with Chris Paul back, Austin Rivers, just the 21 minutes, and Gerald Green, just 10. So if you were still, for whatever reason, holding Ger uh, Austin Rivers in 10, you wouldn't. 12, you wouldn't. 14 team leagues, you know, maybe you still had him, but you can probably move on there. Ken Farid, 36 minutes, 12 and 10, with five assists and two steals. Big game for Farid, a clear must roster player. I've gotten this question a lot as well. Josh, with Farid balling out, does that mean that Capella's going to have his minutes cut when he comes back? I really, really highly doubt that. Capella will come back, he'll play his 33, 34 minutes, and Farid will come in and play 20 minutes. 18 minutes, 17 minutes, and be a good rest guy if he gets in foul trouble. A massive upgrade over the Chris Hardenstein and Nay trio that was running there. Less minutes for PJ Tucker at center. I don't think the Capella is going to have really, and if it is, it's it's a minute, it's two minutes, it's nothing massive on Capella. Freed is not going to be challenging him for the starting job. He's not going to be minute splitting at 26, 22, or anything along. I could be wrong. I just don't see that being the case at all. To me, Capella is significantly better than what Fareed is. The next game, we take a look at the Miami Heat and the New York Knicks. The Heat win 106-97. Tyler Johnson was out. So from out of the rotation entirely to starting, the Duke, Wayne Ellington, played 31 minutes, 19 points with four triples. He did nothing else, and he had no points in the first half whatsoever. Impossible to predict what Spolstra is going to do on a nightly basis. Allington could be in the rotation next game, but he might not be. Who knows? Even if you know, Tyler Johnson remains out along with Derek Jones Jr. Because Dion Waiters played like 26 minutes last game and then played only 18 minutes here despite Jones and Johnson going down. Impossible to predict what these guys are going to do. Scooter Magruder, I thought he'd pick up some of those minutes with Johnson out. He played 22 seconds. So, again, no Jones, no Johnson, limited minutes for Waiters. Magruder couldn't even play. What we had was Kelly Olenek come in and play 17 minutes out of nowhere. We had 31 minutes go to the Duke. It's an impossibility to predict these rotations. Dwayne Wade had 15, 5, and 10. He's been hovering on those fringes of 12-team value. He's probably more of a 14-team league guy. While Whiteside played only 23 minutes, but had 13 and 16 with three blocks. And of course, that puts the pin in any value for Bam Adebayo. And I've continually said this, I just don't see Whiteside getting traded. For the Knicks, Hardaway was great. 22, 6, and 5 on 44%. That's big from him. While speaking of unpredictable rotations... Mario Hazonia went from out of the rotation to playing 30 minutes. Let's rephrase. He went from playing 30 minutes to out of the rotation to playing 30 minutes. 12 and 5 with three steals. You give him 30 minutes a night, then we love it. But I've got no ability to predict that that's going to happen because Fisdale doesn't know. Alonso better than Doncic Trier. He was playing 30 minutes a night. And then two guards go down and he plays under 20 minutes. What? 11 points, two rebounds and two, two assists for Trier. Now, I don't think he's that good of a basketball player. He's a good scorer. He'd be great you know, at playing you know, the uh, street ball type of stuff. He doesn't pass, doesn't know how to pass, doesn't defend. But he's all all over the place, up and down. Fair to say Cantor's never playing for the Knicks again. That's that's done and dusted. And if you're in need of production, you drop him now. If you really, really believe that he's going to get traded into a scenario where he plays 25 minutes and honestly appraise the league's rosters and find out which team that is, which team is giving up stuff to get him and who can actually do that trade, it becomes really, really hard to, to work that out. Um, then you know, holding on to him might be worthwhile. But have a look. You know, where, where's it happening? We keep hearing Sacramento, but is he, does he come into Sacramento and play 25 a night? with Corley Stein there, with Bielitsa, with Bagley, with Giles. Yeah, he's better than probably Corley Stein. But what does Jaeger do? Does Jaeger go and play him 25 and up? Probably not. Look, there's a lot of question marks about it. As for Trier, he was maybe going to be a 12-team league guy, but I can't trust it. Lance Thomas, the Swiss Army knife, he started again. Four points in 18 minutes for Thomas as the Knicks really try to build and develop their players, while Vonley had a... Tw again, he started... He played 25 minutes. Last game, he was a monster in 30-plus. Today, 2-9. He is really unpredictable. And the fort, Kevin Knox, tall Colin Sexton, had four points and two rebounds in 22 minutes, and he was really, really bad. And those minutes went to Hazonia. I think Hazonia is a better player than Knox. I've thought that all season. But I also don't think that Hazonia should necessarily be playing over Knox. I think that Knox needs to be uh, needs to be playing. But again, there is absolutely no way of predicting what Fisdale is going to do. He contradicts himself every day. And people mis misconstrue what I say about Fisdale. And you know, oh, Josh, you know, they're tanking. They've got to develop their young guys. That's why they're not playing Cantor. 
I'm 100% all for that. I've got no problem with that. My problem is, is the lying, is the constant changing, is the no consistency, is the not building guys together who should be playing together. No problem with Canton not playing to give minutes to Mitchell Robinson, not to give them to Lance Thomas, but to give them to Mitchell Robinson. It's telling him he's going to start and then telling your assistant to slink back over three hours later to tell him, oh, no, you're not going to play at all. That's bullshit. The jerking up and down, go and have a look at the Alonzo Trier like minutes graph for this season. It's like a sine curve. And I wish, I think my maths is good enough to remember that that's, a, that's actually accurate and maybe funny. Like that's how these things go and it's frustrating. Hazonia, he's in and out, he's in and out. I, it doesn't make sense. And that's enough of that. Let's go on to the last game of the day. The Phoenix Suns and the Lakers. DeAndre Ayton was out, but Rashawn Holmes was back. He came off the bench and played 27 minutes and was great. 12 and 10 with four blocks. But of course, if Ayton's back next game, you'd still probably hold on to Holmes and think that Ayton would be limited and maybe play 26 minutes and you get 22 minutes of Holmesy and 22 minutes of Holmesy is a 12-team league guy. But then when Ayton pushes back to 32 minutes a night, then his value does dissipate pretty quickly. We got an offensive explosion from McCall Bridges who had 16 and 6 in 37 minutes. Not going to happen all that often. He's a real fringy type of guy. While Ubre had 17 and 5, and he is really like his field goal percentage is a disaster, but he's settling in at, as a multi category producer, something he never has been at any point in his career. Booker had 21 with six assists, while Ali Kobo, with no D'Anthony Melton, played only 22 minutes. That's really disappointing use of him from Kokoshkov. Four, two, and three for Kobo. He could be a short term 12 team league guy while Melton's out, but he's not a high priority. While Joshy Jackson brutalized your field goal percentage. He went 4 of 15 for 12 points. He added the two blocks, and someone called Emmanuel, Me Emmanuel Terry played 9 minutes. He had 5 points, 3 rebounds, and 2 steals, just signed to a 10-day not that long ago. An interesting enough deep league guy. Took Quincy AC's spot, and that's that's your better. I don't understand you're getting AC in there for two 10-day deals and playing him 15 minutes a night. Get a guy like Terry in, play him those minutes, and see what you got. See whether you can develop something like you did with Shaq Harrison, and then you gave him away for nothing. But see what these young guys can do rather than Quincy AC, who's been around, and we pretty much know what he can do. For the Lakers, Zubats was great. 24 and 16, four blocks. Missed his first free throw in about three weeks. Uh, six of seven from the line, 56 from the field. Again, I think he is a guy you want to grab in 12 teamers. Caldwell Pope had 24 and six with four triples, while Ingram really feasted on this team. 21 points, two steals, two blocks, four assists, 82% shooting, but it was without LeBron, it was without Lonzo, and it was without Kuzma. So let's uh, use this maybe as a sell high opportunity. For Ingram, Josh the Hitman Hart, he's dealing with tendonitis apparently. He doesn't look good at the moment. Five points in 17 minutes. He is clearly not a 12-team league guy. While Rondo played 42 minutes and had eight points, four rebounds, 11 assists. He is a 12-team league guy. Beasley got the start over Kuzma, not over Kuzma, in place of Kuzma. Eight, four, and six, a steal, and three box. Four super cool Bs, while Lance Stevenson had 17 points. He had 17 points in about 13 minutes, but ended with 17 points with four assists. And he's going to have some short-term value as sort of that backup point guard guy with uh, with Lonzo currently sidelined. All right, that will uh, do it for us looking at the games from, uh, from Sunday. For those of you listening on audio, we'll do the Week 16 preview now on video. That's on a separate video, so you can go and check that out there. And now we'll move in to talk some DFS action by starting with the perfect lineups. We will go first to DraftKings. Uh, Kyle Lowry, Thomas Satoransky, Doncic, Aldridge, Rishon Holmes, Ravishing Rick Rubio, Andy Wiggins, and Zubats for a total of three ninety-seven, and that cost fifty thousand dollars. And on Fangio, Satoransky, Rubio, Doncic, Wiggins, George, Deng, Aldridge, Holmes, and Zubats for a total of four hundred and seven point seven, and that cost the full. $60,000. All right, guys, let's have a look at DFS for Monday. A weird, just five-game slate coming up for Monday in the NBA. We're going to be focusing on DraftKings pricing for today. The first game we take a look at, the New York Knicks on a back-to-back, -back, taking on the Charlotte Hornets. Um, Injury-wise, uh, Frank Nilakina got hurt on Sunday. We don't know his status at this point. We already know that Emmanuel Moutier is out, so if both of those guys are, are sidelined, we're going to have to see a lot of Trey Burke, maybe some more Alonzo Trier, although curiously today his minutes actually went down despite the absence of Nilakina because against Fisdale, consistency is uh, far from his greatest strength. So let's look at this matchup. Well, Cody's out for Charlotte as well. 
For the spread, the Hornets are 11.5 point favorites. The total here is 217.5. We normally do love getting centers into action against the Knicks. The Hornet centers, maybe not quite as enticing as what some other teams are at. Point guard, Kemba Walker is listed as probable after leaving last game with a neck strain. That's good news. 8,900 for him. A great matchup for Kemba here if he's got a matchup against Trey Burke. We know that 45 is, is not a stretch for Kemba in this scenario, so I do really like him uh, here. As for Nilakina, he wouldn't be worthwhile if he is playing, but Trey Burke does become the interesting one. 4,200 for Trey he can very easily get past that. I think he's a pretty strong cash play in a very positive uh, matchup with the potential for those minutes to really shoot through the roof. Tone Parker missed last game for Charlotte. He should be back after resting, and that'll limit the minutes for Deont uh, Devontae Graham. Uh, as for Trier, he's at 5,300. He had that big game a couple of games ago and then fewer minutes in each of the last two games because, again, there's absolutely no way that you can predict what Fisdale is going to do on a nightly basis. Trier could be an interesting GPP guy. Maybe he transitions into cash value, but 5,300 is a lot for a guy that's not good and a guy whose value is inconsistent and playing time is inconsistent. So maybe you'd consider him more for tournaments than cash. Uh, Jeremy Lamb's at 5,600. I like that for Lamb. The recent production hasn't been great. The matchup's solid here, and it's a pretty strong price. So I like Jeremy Lamb. Damo Dotson, he doesn't really do it for me. Well, Timmy Hardaway, he was strong on Sunday. He has been wildly inconsistent as well, but 5,800 is a strong price for Hardaway, and I like it. And I also really like Nick Batum at 4,900, whose recent form, averaging 26 points over the last five, would bring that value back pretty comfortably. On the wing, Kid Gilchrist, he was big against Milwaukee, but uh, as is the case most of the season, he's always been big against Milwaukee, so I don't really like too much for him here in this matchup against the Knicks, while the fort Kevin Knox continues to struggle, and he is getting worse as the season goes on. For the big men, I talked about the, the Hornets big men with the possibility going up against New York. Bill Hernan Gomez, Bismack Biombo, 3,900 for Hernan Gomez, 42 for Biombo. They're really just tournament guys, almost exclusively based on the matchup. Um, but no real reliability in their level of production. Whereas on the Knicks side, Noah Vonley has been starting. He's at 6,200. He could give you 50. He could give you 10. Uh, and again, today's minutes were well down for Vonley because, again, consistency is absolutely nothing uh, when it comes to Fizdale. I like having a look at Mitch Robinson at 4,100 just for some GPP upside. He actually cracked 20 minutes today, which is always, always a surprise when you get that, especially when he wasn't even in foul trouble. So that's always good news. On FanDuel, I like Marvin Williams quite a bit. 5,400 is a strong price. I like Batum. I like Kemba quite a bit over there. And of course, Trey Burke at that 4,500 mark looks really enticing. The next game, we take a look at the Golden State Warriors and the Indiana Pacers. The Warriors are eight and a half point favorites on the road. The total is 226. Is there a chance that DeMarcus Cousins goes over the 30 minute mark for the first time this season? I think there's a possibility of that. Foul trouble really limited him in the last game. So there is a, there is a chance that, of course, Victor Oladipo is out for the Pacers at point guard. Darren Collison's at 5,900. Collison's averaging 33 over the last five. To me, it's a pretty much a no-brainer selection. 4,200 for Corey Joseph doesn't really get it going for me, while Steph is at 9,100. Steph's been great. He hasn't been giving us great DFS numbers. Now, his recent record against Indiana is fantastic, 54 points over the last couple of years in the last three games. Um, but realistically, I think that with how he's been playing um, and with the Pacers having decent enough defense against point guards, there's probably better ways of spending that money. But there aren't an abundance of studs on this slate, so he's in play, as he always should be. Sean Livingston, Aaron Holley are not really worth it. At shooting guard, Clay's at 6,100. I wouldn't feel comfortable about rostering him in a cash game, more for tournaments. Tyreek's at 52, and he really struggled in that first start for Oladipo. Prior to that, he'd been putting up really strong per minute numbers, and then fell on his face in a starting role. At 5,200, I think he's a tournament guy, but that's about it. While I like Boyan Bogdanovic for cash at 56. The small forwards, I really like Kevin Durant, one of the uh, uh, prime studs on the slate. 9,400 for Durant. He's giving us 48 a night over the last five. I don't really see Bogdanovich or McDermott doing a huge amount to be able to slow Durant down. So I think he is the one who is probably going to uh, top 50 in this game. And then for the big men, I should probably include Thad Young here. He's at 5,700. Eh, it's okay. I just don't see much interest in it. I like Boog. 6,500 for DeMarcus Cousins. I think those minutes can push up to 30. He had 37 points in 23 minutes last game. The production's been really, really strong. We just need those minutes to rise. Well, Draymond at 6,300. I feel like that's a relatively safe floor play at the moment. Miles Turner's at 68. 
He has historically struggled against the Warriors, averaging 14 points the last three times, and that's in 26 minutes a game. That is horrible production. He's obviously been much better than that this season, but I'm not willing to go with him here. While Sabonis at 6,600 also feels like it's a little bit overpriced, Kevon Looney. He's not really doing too much to get me excited. On uh, Fangio, uh, Tyreek and Demarcus Cousins come in pretty strong, I think, 51 and 72 respectively. Kevin Durant at 9,800 I like a lot, as I do with Boyan Bogdanovich at that 5,700 mark. Let's go on to the next game. We've got the Brooklyn Nets and the Boston Celtics. The Celtics are favored by 10. The total is 220. The Nets have a lot of injuries, of course. We know that Spencer Dinwiddie and Karis LeVert are out, but Trevion Graham is questionable. Smoke and Joe Harris is questionable. And Rondé Hollis-Jefferson is probable. Add to that Jared Dudley out with his hamstring injury. Let's look at the point guards. First of, first of all, he has Shabazz Napier's at 46. He played 28 minutes, had 25 points and shot poorly. I love him for cash here, really strong. While Kyrie's at 9,600, who is just absolutely eviscerating people at the moment. There is a risk of a blowout here, which might limit some of the effectiveness for Kyrie, but I still feel okay about him. While D'Angelo Russell at 8,600 struggled one game against the Celtics, blew him out in the next one. Hard to get a full judgment on him. More of a tournament guy because that salary is relatively elevated. Harris is at 49, but he's unsure to play, so I'm not sure we can get into that. Jalen Brown, Marcus Smart, they're not doing it for me. Jason Tatum's at 56. I really like that for Tatum, who's done well against the Nets. He's putting up 30 a night anyway, and at 5,600, that looks like good value. Marcus Morris is one that you can have that. Uh, Rowdy, Rowdy, Ons, Rowdy Rodions, Kurooks, and Trevion Graham, they're not going to do it for me. Theo Pinson's an interesting one. He had 36 points last game, and he's at 4,400. And with all those injuries, he could be in line for an interesting GPP type of punt scenario. If we go into the big men now, I think Rondé Hollis-Jefferson's got a real chance because he's really, really cheap on DraftKings. 3,700. He had 25 points before leaving with that face injury last game, and there's a chance that you're going to have Trivion Graham out, so maybe he comes in and plays high 20s in minutes. That's a super cheap price for Rondé, so I like him. Jarrett Allen at 5,500, struggling a little bit, but he's done well against the Celtics, something that not many centers can usually say. He's worth a GPP punt, while Al Horford at 6,400, he is rolling, averaging 40 over the last three. Happy to use him, and we know centers against the Nets is normally a very, very big money play. Eddie Davis was big last game. I'm not ready to, to really trust that too much. Tice and Bainsey, they're probably not uh, getting me too interested. Over on Fangio, Rondé again at 4,000, Al Horford at 69. Giggity. I think both of those guys look good. Jarrett Allen at 65, probably a little bit too high, even for tournament value. Uh, Kyrie at 10,500 is too high. And I think Jason Tatum at 65 is okay on Fangio without it being absolutely fantastic. The next game we look at, the Denver Nuggets and the Memphis Grizzlies. The Nuggets are five-point favorites. The total is 209.5. Bruno Caboclo was fantastic last game, but the Grizzlies have upgraded Kyle Anderson to questionable. So the, uh, the Bruno breakout might be somewhat limited if Kyle does happen to return in this one. We know that Garrett Temple is out for the next couple of weeks. For the point guards, actually, uh, quickly, Jamal Murray, the Blue Arrow, he is out of this one as well. At point guard, Mike Conley, 7,700. He's just giving us 40 a night. Now, Denver has defended and guarded point guards well this season. 7,700, though, for Conley is still, uh, still, still pretty strong. While Javon Carter at 33, he started last game. He played 26 minutes, and he had 0 0.75 points. That's pretty hard to do. Um, with Anderson potentially returning, I'm not sure that Carter's value is right there. And as for Anderson at 4,500, I'm not... Yeah, coming back from an ankle injury, we don't know if he's going to play. He's not a high producer in general. Not super interested there. Shelvin Mack at 36. He's a, I think Mack is a weird tournament flyer guy, but not that interesting. While Malik Beasley gets a bit of a reprieve with Murray out, 4,200 for Malik, but he hasn't been a great DFS option because of his inability to contribute in other categories apart from points. Justin Holiday at 4,500. I like the price. I like the opportunity here for Justin. Even if Kyle Anderson's back, I think that Holiday does remain starting. While Gaz Harris... No! He's at 5,800, hasn't really been rolling at this point. I think that's probably a little bit too high for Gary, while uh, Farton Will Barton should start at point guard again, and his salary is all the way up to 6,900, so a lot of the value is taken away from him. Um, on the wing, Jermichael Green at 48, he's battling knee issues, so I think I'll probably leave him alone. He's listed as probable. He's not really someone I'm all that keen on using here. Then you've got Trey Lyles and Caboclo, who had 25 points last game. He had 3,400 for Bruno. There could be a massive opportunity for him if Anderson doesn't play, and he would become a pretty strong option, especially in uh, tournaments. For the big men, Triple J, Jaron Jackson Jr., 
5,700, I like him here. I like him quite a bit. That's a nice price. While Gasol at 78 also looks really strong with a safe, safe floor, I believe. And Jokic at 10,800. He is just rolling at the moment. He's averaging 68 over his last three, 57 over the last five. I'll take that any day of the week. And that is an elevated price, but it's a, it's a good price. Millsap is a, is a strongest of strong fades. And uh, Mason Plumley at 30. Actually, Mason Plumley at 39 is not a bad low price guy to fill out your roster. He had 32 points in 22 minutes last game. He's averaging 22 over the last five in just 18 minutes. That's value at 3,900. And it might enable you to put a guy like Jokic alongside someone like Durant into your lineup. On Fangio, Barton comes in much better, 63, as does Gaz Harris at 48. Justin Holiday at 49 looks strong too. Gasol and Conley at 83,000. No, that's a lot. 8,300 apiece uh, also come in pretty nicely over on Fangio. All right, the last game of the day for Monday it's the Atlanta Hawks and the LA Clippers. I'm not really sure why there's no spread out for this one at this point. Maybe they're waiting to see on Danilo Gallinari, but he is unlikely to play in this game and in the Clippers next game, but that's about it. Then he should be ready to return after that. Now the point guards, Patrick Beverly's at 4,500. He had a massive game today, 47 points in 36 minutes. The minutes have been way up for Bev- Beverly. That price is really, really strong. I love him as a cash play. Gildress Alexander's more tournaments. His value sort of waxes and wanes each game. He's at 3,800 here. He's not a bad guy to look at, but there are better must-play guys. And I do like Trey Young, who's killing it at the moment. He had 53 points earlier in the season against the Clippers, 48 in his last game. 6,700 is a strong, strong price for him, while Jeremy Lin's at 42. Not a bad cash player, a decent enough floor player, Lin, but not really a high-priority uh, tournament sort of a guy. Um, the uh, the shooting guards in this one, we're looking at Avery Bradley, who's actually playing all right, and at 3,700 with Gallinari out, I feel good about getting 20 out of Bradley, which is not a bad low price guy to slot in. Uh, for the Hawks, you've got Kevin Herter and DeAndre Bembry. Both of these guys really sucked last game, didn't even get to 10 points. I would use a Herter over Bembry in this one, but I'm not super interested in either of them. And then you go to the small forwards. The artist formerly known as Tory and Prince played 36 minutes last game off the bench at 5,400. I'm, I'm looking at him for a real bounce back or a, a re-breakout game, so to speak. And Toby Harris at 8,000. Generally, he's been getting about 40 a night with Gallinari out. So I think 40 a night for $8,000, that's really the spot you want to be in. For the big men, The Undertaker, Dwayne Dedman's at 5,500. He's getting that nearly every night, and we know centers against the Clippers. That's almost better than centers against the Bulls, Knicks, and Nets. It's a really, really good matchup. Same with power forward. So I like The Undertaker here a lot. The Baptist, John Collins, power forwards against the Clippers. That's strong, but his price is big, 8,200. And given the fact that he just can't block a single shot apparently anymore, 8,200 feels a little bit too high. I didn't talk about Lou Williams earlier. Uh, 7,400 for him. I do like him quite a bit too. The table, Montrez Harrell's at 7,100, a decent enough matchup for him. Yeah, not my strongest play on the board, but there is some value there with him, whereas Gortat and uh, the wizard Amari Spellman, I don't really think there's any value with those guys. On Fangel, Beverly, I like Prince, Harrell, Bradley, Williams, Harris as well. Value in all of those guys. Trey Young at 72 is still pretty strong on Fangel also, and Shea is more of that GPP player. Let's have a look at some studs and value plays across the sides. On DraftKings, I like Durant as my stud, and value is Patrick Beverly. Fangio, we're going with Durant and Beverly as well. On Yahoo, it's Jokic and Tyreek Evans' minimum salary. And then on DraftStars, it's Kevin Durant and Mitchell Robinson of the New York Knicks. That'll wrap it up for today's show. Check out the rest of the shows across the network, including uh, all of your favorite NBA and NFL teams you want to hear locked on Patriots and locked on Rams before the Super Bowl next week as well. And the best way to listen is to tell your smart speaker to play the podcast locked on and then use the team name after that. Follow me on Twitter at RedRock underscore Beeble. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Jim Boylan.